So ladies and gentlemen, I am very, very overjoyed to introduce you to our host for the day, one of my close friends, Liana Sananda, who is the Director of Development for MAPS. Let's have a hand for Liana. Good, e good day, beautiful humans. We are here, we are, this is the second to last day of our Entheo Generation Speaker Series. It has been an incredible experience and we have a totally incredible stack day of psychedelic superheroes all day long today. Who here in the crowd has come out to one of the talks that we've hosted this week? All right, awesome. So we're beginning off today. I mean, we are in the middle of a renaissance right now. There is a huge shift in public opinion about psychedelics. We are hearing it from Fox News to supporting veterans. The work we're doing at MAPS, we are in the final phase before FDA will approve MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is such an incredible gift to come to Burning Man and to host this speaker series with all of you today. We also are working with the Zendo Project, which is supporting people through difficult or challenging psychedelic experiences, and Zendo is camped all around here. And so with that, I would love to kick off the day. We have an incredible conversation. We have Jason Silva, who is a storyteller, a futurist. He's best known for his shots of awe on YouTube. Some of you might have seen that. He's an incredible mind and philosopher on everything from life to love to time and everything in between. Uh, and right next to him, we have Seth Miller, who runs Fearless Ventures, which is focused on bringing humanity into flow states by supporting companies that are shaping the future. It is also Seth's 17 burn in a row. He is a co-founder, yeah. He is a, a co-founder of Disco Space Shuttle and one of his, yeah. We got, some, we got some space shuttle people in the house, I see, awesome. Uh, one of his Burning Man highlights was bringing his 84 and 86 year old mom and dad to the playa last year. So I'm gonna hand it off to these two and let it flow. Uh, Liana, thank you. And to MAPS and to Bronner's and to Zendo for all the amazing work that all three organizations are doing. Um, and to all of you for being here and bringing your energy and your curiosity and um, the light of your souls. So, uh, can you hear us? All right. A little better? All right. Nice. That's the uh, so, Jason and I talked about um, giving a little framework at the start. And so, uh, we thought Jason's definition for flow state was uh, this one state of consciousness where human beings feel their best, perform their best. Um, and uh, we think that maybe people are curious about our own means of achieving those states, both psychedelic and non-psychedelic. Um, there's a, uh, a poem in which Rumi says something like, um, I'm gonna butcher it, but the gist is, ours is not to seek for love, but instead to seek inside ourselves to find the barriers that we're putting up that prevent us from being love. And to me, that's the key of flow state. And there are different ways of finding and removing those barriers so that you are in a state of being love. Uh, and with that... That's quite beautiful. Yeah. That's actually a great opening because right off the bat, it made me think of a very similar quote written uh, in a fictitious article or piece of fiction in Esquire magazine and it was about an actor who really, he was like an up and coming, like next hot thing and he took himself really seriously and he just, he wanted to be the best at his craft and then one day he was given the opportunity to meet like one of his heroes, like a Jack Nicholson type and meet with him for coffee and you know they sit down and he starts talking about how frustrated he is and, 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 and how blocked he feels and he can't just like he wants to like achieve greatness you know and he wants to just like make art that breaks people open and, and then the fictitious Jack Nicholson elder actor tells him you know the problem with you young lads is that you need to stop trying to make art and just become art. And I think that is very apropos 
because it's precisely what happens when you enter a flow state. Um, just out of curiosity, any of you guys familiar with the book Stealing Fire? Jamie Wheel, Stephen Kotler. Yeah, wonderful book. And both of those guys are they're two of my heroes because they, they, they gave me frameworks of understanding for a state of consciousness that I have essentially oriented my life around. And I used to think of these states as haphazard states of consciousness that emerged when the perfect conditions were there, but I didn't know what those conditions were. I hadn't mapped the flow triggers. I didn't know the neurochemistry of what was happening in my brain. I just knew that there were certain moments of radiance and wonder and awe when I felt cracked open, when I lost myself, when I found myself, when I was moved to tears, when the light got in, you know, whereas once we were blind, now we can see. And most of our lives end up being defined by these divinations, these glimpses of some sublime, some great beyond. And it is in these moments that we have an acute understanding of ourselves and of the world. You know, we blast new tunnels between ourselves and the other. And fuck, like, what's going on, you know? Those that are lucky enough to figure out a way to harness flow on tap become prolific artists, painters, poets, musicians, screenwriters, carpenters, you know, whatever it is that your thing is. And so for me in my work, it has sent me on a journey to try to make sense of flow and figure out how to get more of it, as Jamie Wheel likes to say. Um, that's, that's, yeah. that's perfect. Uh, so one of the things that's coming up for me on that is um, stealing fire is amazing, and it's, the frameworks are awesome. Um, in, uh, there's peak experiences, and then there's regular discipline of daily practice. These are two things that together can uh, help us crack the riddle of unblocking and getting into being art or being flow. Um, and this is why the psychedelic and non-psychedelic means work together so well. And for me, in my experience, it's the weaving together of both that has helped me to ladder up. And they describe it in the book of you have a baseline of your daily awareness and how you go through life. And a lot of it is boxed in by these blocks that we put in, our own fears and insecurities and thoughts of limitations and things like that that keep us from accessing these states of flow. And these peak experiences pop us out into the sublime, the other and all of that, and crack us open and you feel awe and inspiration or you lose yourself and find yourself, right? Um, and it's the, the people think often of the peak experiences as a thing that's gonna get me there. But those peak experiences last for a period of time, show you a heightened state or of openness, and then you come back down and get back into the normal life and you've lost that again. We turn into seekers constantly seeking that heightened state. And the finding it is actually in the mundane, like the doing the laundry kind of stuff. That's the daily discipline that weaves in the lessons of what you found in that state. No, it's, it's very true. That reminds me a lot of, um a TEDx talk that Jamie Wheel did a couple of years ago here in Burning Man, and the title says it all. It was called From Altered States to Altered Traits, Hacking the Flow State. And he essentially says that, that most humans that are oriented around bliss or pleasure essentially become bliss junkies. And so that's kind of what all of us to an extent are. We get, we get hooked on these states, but then we have to come back into ourselves. and. Sometimes that's a bummer, sometimes it's a hangover, sometimes it's the consequences of mistreating our bodies in the search of these exalted states of being. But, and, and he goes further, he says, you could think of your self-system as something like a leaky bucket or a colander, and so you can turn on the faucet constantly to get yourself something closer to full, but you're always leaking, and as soon as you turn the faucet off, your leaky bucket is emptied. But then he says, instead of getting hooked on these states, what about raising the stage itself? What if we could turn our leaky buckets into chalices, right? These are his words. How might we render not just ourselves whole, but how might we render ourselves holy? You know, and this like turns me on on a poetic level, because like if you think of the, the basic definition of a flow state is a state of consciousness in which you feel your best and you perform 
your very best. And there are these characteristics that every flow state has. They use an acronym so we can remember it, STIR. STIR stands for selflessness, timelessness, effortlessness, and richness, information richness. So your sense of self dissipates. By that we mean the nagging inner chatter, the insecurity, right? The thing that gets in the way of you like taking the chance of hurling yourself into the abyss to find that it's a feather bed. So your sense of self is relieved of being on duty, you know? And so it's like, hallelujah. And then time gets dilated, right? So you might go from Kronos to Kairos. Now you're in the timeless. Now you're in the eternal now, the forever box. So selflessness, timelessness, effortlessness, or effortless effort in that you're doing this impossible thing, but it's like fucking A. It just comes through you, but not from you. And though it is with you, it belongs not to you, as Khalil Gibran said. So you just get into this beautiful space and you have access to more information. Pattern recognition increases lateral thinking increases, you get a boost of dopamine. I mean, there's a whole thing that transpires and performance levels go through the roof. Elite athletes hack flow and that's why they're always fucking pushing the envelope of what they can achieve. The so people who figure out how to get into these states achieve the impossible and they give us glimpses of what's possible for all of us if we were to get better at reverse engineering this. So not just to, to go from bliss junkies to actually raising the stage. Uh, all of that, yes. The neurobiology, put on hold for a second. Taking it from wholeness to holy, I love, because today's track is about spirituality and mysticism as well. And this is where it ties in together also, because in those states of flow, you're connected to something far beyond yourself because you're shutting down the prefrontal cortex and losing the sense of self in the neurobiology side of things. Um, that comes back to the Rumi quote, which is, in, in my experience, we'll get into some of our experiences, I, I think, at least I'd like to, um, where uh, in, that, in that space, uh, it's, it's a holy space. Um, and uh, it is, I find spirituality in that when I lose my sense of self and feel that connection to everything around us. In this, this is to me uh, what humanity is meant to be to be in our full, emergent, creative space, to constantly be creating in flow and not limiting ourselves from judgment and being in that place where, where we just generate. And when we're in that place and we're connected and generating, we are capable of things like Burning Man. This is what we build. It's beautiful, it's holistic, it's in cohesion with the system, and it generates love and life and beauty. No, I totally agree with that. I mean, I think you could, you could, there's this book, I think it's by Bruno Latour. I think it's about, and it's called something like Modes of Being. So there, there's these different like modes of being, you know, and the Greeks talked about Kronos and Kairos. So Kronos is like mechanized cognition, fetching water, chopping wood, consensus reality, working together and agreeing upon certain set points. So it's mechanized cognition and necessary for the build week, you know, necessary for you guys to show up here at 1 p.m. to have this talk, but in the hopes that during the talk, it gives rise to a Kairos experience. And Kairos, again, is the realm of the sacred, the realm of the timeless, and the realm of the sublime. And so moving between those domains, between those two modes, I think is, is, is vital to play with flow. You know, there's um, a great line by Ursula Le Guin, and I, I love it so much, so I'm often reciting it. She says, science describes accurately from the outside Poetry describes accurately from the inside. Science explicates, poetry implicates. Both celebrate what they describe. So you could describe a flow state on the neuroscience dimension, you know, on the literal grid, fMRI scans of the brain, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex shuts down, different parts of the brain talk to each other, etc. All true from the outside. Just like when you go see a movie from the outside, it's two hours and 20 minute running time, it's 24 frames per second, it's been edited over the course of a year and a half, actors were memorizing lines, the whole thing. But from the inside of watching a movie, well, holy fucking shit, you have an encounter with consciousness ex itself, you know? You meet yourself in the screen, you learn your own fucking shadows, you pierce the veil. So both are true. And I think for me, flow from the inside now, I'm a language person. Others might compose a song. You know, Beethoven might write his best symphony when he's in flow to express not just 
through flow, his symphony, but evoke flow in the listening to the symphony. And the only thing that I find that, that satiates me in response to flow is to turn to not literal language, but poetic language. Because poetic language can take poetic license. There's a great line by a guy called Alan de Botton, and he says, while a journalist might be more accurate in describing the details of an event, right, that's still a kind of naive realism. But the poet may reveal truths of a deeper sort that are beyond the literal grid. And so to make sense of that, we turn to our poets. You know, it's F. Scott Fitzgerald's notion of man must have held his breath during these moments, compelled into aesthetic contemplations he barely understood nor desired, face to face with something commensurate to his capacity for wonder. You know, I read that and I'm like, that fucking feeling. You know, when I was in Kauai and I smoked a joint and went to see the Nepali coast, the only thing I could turn to to make sense of my experience was, here I am. I'm compelled to aesthetic contemplations I barely understand face to face with something can measure it to my capacity for wonder. It has happened, you know? And I would say that all of my work has been about making sense of these experiences in language because it's a way of evidencing what has transpired. Like, I know that it's real because I have brought something back. Like Jordan Peterson, the psychologist, says artists contend with the unknown, right? They hurl themselves into the abyss and then they bring it back into time. You know, when you have some glimpse of divination that you can actually bring back into time and share with other people, that is, that is a fucking alchemical act. You know what I mean? And we can all do it, right? There's that great line by Terence McKenna where he says, nature loves courage, right? You make the commitment and nature responds to that commitment by removing impossible obstacles. You dream the impossible dream and the world will not grind you under, it will lift you up. This is the secret. This is what all the professors and philosophers, all the wise men, those who really touched the alchemical gold, this is what they understood. This is the shamanic dance in the waterfall. This is how magic is done. You hurl yourself into the abyss and you realize that it's a feather bed. And so it's like the, the mystics and the madmen, they've put it out there. The words are there, you know? Blake fucking said it perfectly. You see the world in a grain of sand, heaven in a wildflower, infinity in the palm of your hand, eternity in an hour. And so as long as we can keep these domains separate, right? The literal grid and the poetic grid, we won't have an issue with integrating things that are beyond our comprehension and hint at our divination, but we can still bring it back into the world, put a suit around it and be like, I had this experience and avoid becoming a self-righteous prick, which can so often happen when people have ego dissolving experiences that then turn their ego even bigger. We've all seen like spiritual ego. And so it's very important that when you have that experience, that's for you. And if you want to share it, share it as a poem, not as a militant religious truth. You know, share it as a poem, share it as art. Exhibit A, flow state. <laughs> uh, so uh, what's coming up for me is poetry clearly is something that for you, you lose your sense of self into the magic of that. Nature is something I heard you bring up and also psychedelics, right? A combination of things can get you out of yourself and into these things. We are feeling so much magic. There are other methods, and Jamie and Steven talk about it, like meditation, dance, motion, exercise. There's breath work. A bunch of you may have done breath work sessions or meditation sessions anytime this week. These are different things that can help us shift out of it. Um, there are other practices as well. Uh, the, we could maybe talk about some of sure. the interesting ones that we've done. Like there's, well, I, can yeah. tell you, I can tell you that there's practices that I have not developed and I need to develop. One of the lessons for me in being in a relationship for a year is that I need to learn to be more embodied. Because while I tap into a more embodied state when I'm in flow, my default is more than I'm in my head. So embodiment practices seem to be very, 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 very important to getting into flow. The other things that definitely work are certain kinds of drugs. It is what it is. For me, cannabis is probably the, the easiest shortcut to evoking something like a flow state. Stephen Kotler famously says a hippie speedball is 20 minutes of aerobic exercise, um, an espresso shot and a joint is his shortcut to a flow state. But I still think this is in combination with the context 
Because all plant medicines create infinite resonance with set and setting. So the environment and the context and the intention is very important because you're essentially making yourself more suggestible to whatever the input signals from within and from without are occurring around you in the moment that you take whatever plant medicine. Now, if you guys read Michael Pollan's new book, How to Change Your Mind, it's all about psychedelic healing. So in the preface of the book, he really hints at both the default human condition and the way that we get to the realms of the timeless. He says that the brain essentially, the default setting of the brain is like an artificial intelligence program. So we take in data from the present, compare it with data from the past, and use it to make inferences about the future. That's like what we're always doing, to mitigate against future threats, right? The problem is that we're always doing that. So we're future-oriented and anxious as our default setting. Now, what he says is that there's certain kinds of things like art, like travel, like novelty, basically experiences that violate your expectations because you're always forming expectations, the been there's and seen that's of the adult mind. So experiences that violate your expectations, travel, novelty, sex, certain kinds of drugs, is that these experiences block all signals forwards and backwards in the brain. So you're no longer doing the comparing this with the past and inferring what this is. You're no longer doing that immediate and unconscious, jaded assumption, arrogant assumption of, I know what this is, I don't want to go, or I don't want to really engage with this because I've been there, I've seen that. And that's kind of bullshit, right? You stop learning. So when you block all signals forwards and backwards, this is, I mean, he, he just hinted it perfectly. When you're in these moments, you drop into the flow, he uses the word flow, of the present. And the qualities, right, the qualitative properties of the flow of the present is that the present is literally wonder-full, right? Wonderful. Wonder, and this is the key part, wonder being the byproduct of that unencumbered sense of first sight and virginal noticing to which the adult brain has closed itself. So you are a child again. You are awake. You are alert, right? You are aware. You are paying attention. Absolute unmixed attention is a form of prayer. That's what Simon Weil wrote. It's a beautiful truth. Charles Darwin said, attention is the hinge. Attention, if sudden and close, graduates into surprise, and this into astonishment, and this into stupefied amazement. So what we're capable of when we drop into the flow of the present is everything. So the, 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 the takeaway would be pay attention to the triggers. What are they for you? Are they your contemplative practices? Is it your meditation? Is it your tea ceremony? Is it playing the guitar? Is it traveling? You know, is it novelty? Is it sex? Is it smoking a joint at sunset on the playa and going and contemplating the art? Pay attention to what hurls you into the present. And really, that's where the answers lie. Uh, I love all that again. And uh, two things coming up for me are uh, set and setting are important, intentions are really important, and integration is really important. Um, in all of these things, there are three things that run through it for me, and that's uh, connection, curiosity, and surrender. In my practice, uh, the things that I've been dabbling with to build a discipline that allows me to ladder up the baseline as I add in peak experiences along the way. Those three things uh, I keep in mind all the time and they've helped a lot. Um, and connection can start out as connection with other human beings, like staring into somebody else's eyes, do eye gazing ceremony. Um, but in the end, it's about connection with yourself and the essence of whatever life is, the universe, life force, all of that. As you lose yourself in the flow state, you end up in connection. You're removing the blocks that say, I am an ego and I am this in the skin bag and all of that. And you're opening that up. With curiosity, you're constantly in wonder what's coming up, what's coming up, what's arising within this field, what's arising around this field, what's mine to do, what's happening, and surrender. Just let go and follow. And all of those things, you're removing the barriers to what's coming through you and the emergent process and the creative force that is humanity. Yeah, yeah I know it. Something that comes to mind hearing that is uh, the word surrender gets used a lot here in Burning Man. It gets used a lot in psychedelic practice, right? Um, and, and I'm not going to lie, like for me, surrender uh, there is an edge. It always has been an edge. I, I'm, I, I, my, my proclivity, my predisposition is more towards caution 
and evaluating things a lot and asking a lot of questions and it being annoyingly sometimes neurotic and wanting to understand all the variables before I feel safe enough to like relax, you know, and unclench. And this guy, Jordan Peterson, who I, I, I often enjoy his m philosophical meanderings, he said that we essentially have to learn to toe the line between chaos and order. Because the part of you that wants to feel safe is also vital. And those of us that are more oriented towards caution typically had some formative experience when we were young and innocent that sidelined us and made us feel unsafe. And the body keeps the score, right? So that trauma remains. And in a way, that trauma can become your superpower, you know, because it makes you maybe you more diligent and more careful and cautious and maybe less likely to do something reckless. But the problem is you can get so good at being careful that then you never have any fun, right? The good news is I'm seldom surprised. The bad news is I'm seldom surprised, you know, as Michael Pollan wrote. And so, so when Jordan Peterson says, towing the line between chaos and order, it reminds me also of this Venn diagram that I saw. The Imaginary Foundation says, and one of them is disciplined, and one of them is surrender, these overlapping circles. And then the one that has both is flow. So that flow is actually surfing the wave between chaos and order. And, and I think sometimes the, the, the narrative or the side of the argument that is pro-surrender forgets to talk about the importance of discipline. So I often like to use the term discipline surrender. And in the context of a psychedelic journey, an idea, an approach to that would be, you know, have you spent some time like reading about this medicine? Have you read both the scientific accounts of what it does to the brain and some of the poetic reveries and rhapsodies that poets have written while under the medicine? You know, have you been, been diligent in who you're going to get it from and that the medicine is going to be pure and that it's dose appropriate, that you sort of know what to expect? Have you set the intention? Have you designed for a set and setting that is conducive to human flourishing? Because you can design for that. You can architect for that, right? You're kind of rolling the dice in a way whenever you go into liminal spaces, but you can fucking plan in your favor, at least to a certain extent. You're certainly expected to do that in the default world. Why not bring some of that into our deep states of surrender? So I, I often like to use this, this notion of, of discipline surrender. And, and you know, it, 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 for me, it's what works. So I just wanted to put that out there. So I love that discipline surrender. <clears throat> so some of the means of discipline, discipline surrender that I played around with, meditation is one. Um, Embodiment is another thing that you mentioned, which is a big thing. It's like, so as you are seeking to build a practice of removing the blockages and letting yourself into flow state and love, um, finding ways to get out of your head and into your body are some of the best things you can do. Um, it's hard sometimes for me. It's, it's super hard for me as well. Uh, so um, one of the things that's been a key practice for me is regularly on a daily basis, noticing and allowing whatever is arising within my field of awareness. So sensations, emotions, thoughts, and the observer. So for me, uh, there's one truth in life, only one truth, and that is I am having an experience and I'm aware of it, that's it. This could all be a simulation, it could be a dream, I could be on a trip, I don't know what this is. I can't prove anything other than I am aware of my experience. And there's four components of that experience for me, those things that I just mentioned. And as I notice and allow, the more I let go of my attachment to being right about anything that's happening, the more I can surrender both into embodiment out of my head and into whatever is arising into my field of awareness. And that practice in a non-psychedelic state also helps me get deeper in psychedelic states and it helps me shake loose of all the trauma-based preconceived notions of what's gonna happen next or who I am at any one point in time that limits what I think I am capable of or what's coming through me. Amen. That, uh, I, I've definitely contended with anxiety. You know, we, I know that we have kind of a, a global mental health epidemic going on and the pathologies of anxiety and of depression and PTSD and OCD and all these other pathologies of the mind have reached like critical mass. More people are killing themselves now uh, than are dying from natural disasters and armed conflict combined. That's a United Nations fact. It's, it's absolutely insane. So it's like you're, you're in more danger of killing yourself than getting hit by a terrorist attack by, by a long shot. So we have these pathologies of the mind that are reaching a critical mass. And 
What's really interesting is this neuroscientist out of London, neuroscientist Robin Carthart Harris, Imperial College of London, has come up with a theory to account for all of these mental illnesses. It's called the entropic brain theory. And it's characterized essentially, so if you think of the, the, the seat of the soul or the ego, uh, the autobiographical mind as they describe it, is something called the uh, default mode network. And what can, and granted, that's important. Fetch water, chop wood, you know, the ego gets the book written, the whole thing. But, doing this. Um, but the, the problem with a default mode network that has been sidelined by some early trauma or something like that is that it becomes overactive. It metastasizes into a terrible tyrant. So the ego becomes something that's always on guard. And so depression, anxiety, PTSD, OCD, all of these are, are basically defined by sharing uh, rigid patterns of thinking and intrusive thoughts, right? Whether they're the world is caving in and depression or the world is tearing me apart, you know, anxiety. And, and they all essentially hint at Lenses of perception that have become overly constricting that you're not aware that you have and that are no longer serving you, right? So it's like you have lenses of perception that color and curtail your world. And you see with the lenses and we see, you see through the lenses, but you don't see the lenses themselves. And a wonderful article in Aeon Magazine about psychedelics healing, psychedelic healing, said that psychedelics work by violating your expectations and violating your models of reality. Because if you are, your default mode network has gone like over rigid and you're like in deep depression or deep anxiety and you're not responding to traditional medications, I could tell you, you're like bedridden with anxiety. I could like give you the knowledge that there are another, there's another way to see things, that life can be different, that life can get better, but that's knowledge by description and that that doesn't necessarily seep through. Psychedelics work because they dissolve your expectations about reality. An overactive default mode network is essentially negatively prefiguring everything that's coming in. So everything is tinged with the expectation of this is more fuel for my depression or my anxiety. But if you violate those expectations, which only an ego dissolving agent can do, you're essentially giving a person an experience of knowledge by acquaintance rather than knowledge by description. And that has epistemic value because once you fucking grab a person and their sense of self and physically put them somewhere else, right, which is what the psychedelic is doing, it's showing them, by, it's acquainting them with the felt experience of another way to see things, of another way to plant your feet. And the minute you see things from a different lens, you realize you had a fucking lens to begin with. And you're like, that fucking lens wasn't serving me. So now you can dispense and replace the previous lens because you've bumped up a level and can now see that you had a lens. It's like a metacognitive leap. And so at that point, it doesn't even matter the mentation or the content of your psychedelic experience. You saw God, you merged with the universe. Your poetic truth is yours alone. The epistemic value is that the quantifiable and measurable reality is that the person comes out of the experience having had a felt experience, right? A knowledge by acquaintance experience that changes how they operate in the world in a way that we can measure for real. So they're more open to new experiences, they're more willing to take on new projects, they're kinder, they're more compassionate, they're more creative. That we can measure, and that is enough for us to be like, here is fucking healing for these pathologies of the self without having to have debates about the metaphysical reality of the interior experience the person had. It matters not except to them. What matters is the epistemic reality that once you have a felt experience, knowledge by acquaintance of another way to see things, you finally see light at the end of the tunnel. And that's why these experiences, I think, can cure people of these pathologies of an overly rigid, intrusive thought, default mode network that has metastasized. Thank you very much. Yeah. We've got just a few minutes to take a question or two. Yeah? Or until question, 10 minutes. We have 10 minutes? Three minutes until questions. Okay, cool. Let me do one quick story on uh, something that I did that is a non-psychedelic means of cracking myself open. And it was uh, right after a five, my one five MEO experience, five MEO DMT experience. And the following eight days, uh, I would wake up two or three times at night and I would hold my breath. I would do three deep breaths and then I would hold my breath and I would relax into noticing and allowing. Everything that came up, a hair across my face, it itches. Move that, you'd feel better. No, notice and allow the itch and the desire to move. Notice my hip was getting sort of sore because I hadn't moved in a while. 
Um, the desire to move that, notice it, don't do anything. The desire to swallow, because I hadn't swallowed as time goes on, right? And I'm like, no, just then that becomes a little more agonizing. And then the desire to breathe. The desire to breathe became so insistent, it was like, fucking breathe, you're gonna die, right? Like, hello. And no, just notice and allow. At some point, the pain of not breathing and the desire to breathe crowded out all of my awareness. And it became everything, and it became nothing. And it became effortless. And I sat in the not breathing with no effort. And suddenly my body breathed on its own, and I got shot back into my 5-MEO, full-on psychedelic experience, gone from my body, music in the background, the grid, the light, everything. Two or three times a night for eight straight days. What I learned from that was that my attachment to discomfort, to thinking that the pain of not breathing was more preferable than breathing, was something that has me in a box. And by simply noticing and allowing and being in that state of connection of everything that's going on without jumping to fix something, it cracked me open into a completely different state. And from there, I saw the beauty of the game of peekaboo of being in unity and an ego and in unity and ego or preference of any particular state happening being a way that I was trying to control something for an outcome that I thought was afraid of that would be so painful. And what I realized from that was that every sensation whether it's pain, sorrow, anger, joy, sexual feelings, creativity, whatever it is, is part of this amazing emergent symphony that we play through our sensations at every time. And no one thing is good or bad. It all is, and it's all part of this beautiful symphony. That's an example of a non-psychedelic means of leveling up your game with peak experiences on a regular basis that was practiced. I think we should take some questions. Sure. Um, yeah, he was asking about my own personal practices with mediating altered states experiences. Yeah, I am a big fan of MDMA uh, because so much of my hangups are anxiety related. There's a guy called David Lenson. He wrote a book called On Drugs. It's about the phenomenology of drug use. And one of the things that he talks about is that during bad trips, uh, sight and hindsight can flip sides during a psychedelic trip. And he says that expectations are in some sense permanent. So you bring your own baggage into an altered state's experience. But that also applies when you're sober if you suffer from anxiety. You're bringing your own baggage, your past trauma, your expectations to the doorstep of every moment. And he describes anxiety as essentially temporal dislocation. So you're not in the present. Your past experience is actually misrepresenting and over-determining what's happening now and conjuring up a future that becomes identified with death and doom. Some of the anxiety that I have suffered from is exactly that. Whether it's a panic attack or just really morose levels of anxiety that are, I was like, am I gonna die or am I going, am I gonna, can I go crazy, fear of losing my mind, fear of death, all these things. And you know, solar plexus, like turns into a knot. And that has been the, the most difficult factor, the thing that has impeded me from being able to like surrender into the much more creative, much more embodied realms of the numinous. So I, the primary medicine for me has been cannabis for about 15 years. And I know that now that cannabis is so in vogue, people don't even think of it as a psychedelic, but it is very much a plant medicine. Even Rick Doblin once said that uh, cannabis will take you as far as LSD if you let it. I've also though, had certain experiences on cannabis that have been really horrendous. And I think for that reason, my sidestepping into things like LSD and mushrooms has been, I've been a bit kind of not, not, not ready to go full on. But I've worked with MDMA, with a psychedelic therapist, under a nurse several different times. So I would say MDMA and cannabis have been my, my primary medicines. I don't drink alcohol anymore. I used to love alcohol precisely because of its disinhibitory qualities. And uh, I remember I used to find it 
so refreshing to feel so at ease in myself. And then it, but then of course, hangovers and all the negative consequences of alcohol you know, were weighed heavily on me, so I don't drink anymore. But I still think that there is something about surrendering inhibition without the fear that letting go is going to lead to negative consequences that, that is at the fruit of, of, of my happy place, you know? Trust. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, are there any emerging technologies that we're excited about that are encouraging or helping people achieve flow states? Um, I mean, f the things I'm most excited about are the actual organic technologies. So all of the psychedelics have been around for a long time, most of them. Um, and they are amazing tools for helping us crack open. Um, you might not think of, I mean, mushrooms are a technology, right? Tim Chang, a good friend of ours, likes to talk about the ancient technologies that have come through time to us, back to us again. Um, you might not think of a system of studying as a technology, but there are things out there like this program called Conscious Leadership created by Diana Chapman and Jim Detmer that borrows from a bunch of different systems like Byron Katie and Gaten Katie Hendricks and things like that. Uh, that has taught me an awful lot about things like noticing and surrendering or there's things like the Enneagram, another beautiful tool for understanding your own trauma and motivations. Um, and I highly recommend looking into that as well. These are all things that help you to unlock. And they're not what you think of as like, you know, software and hardware together that are bumping people into flow state. But these are technologies. Yeah. And those are some of the things I'm most excited about. Oh, for sure. Um, ecstatic technologies of all kinds, both the organic ones and also Jamie Wheel. You guys should Google the Flow Dojo. It's this like setup that they like create for at different companies or different retreats. And it's, it's basically an exploratorium for adults. It's pretty similar to a lot of like the interactive things you find on the playa sometimes. Things that basically hurl you into an embodied state um, and, and tend to have a little bit of risk so that you also, it's also a prerequisite for flow. Not too much risk that overwhelms you, but enough risk that heightens focus because flow follows focus. Me and my girlfriend spent like 45 minutes on swings the other day and like reconnected with our childhood. I was purring from pleasure from something as simple as being on a swing, but it's like, it makes sense. It's like, oh yeah, like I'm swinging my body up through the air and down, you know, and I was like, I was high for the rest of the day after that. Um, one of the things they do with the Flow Dojo is they also like have all these biofeedback like measurements and all these sensors that they put on you so they can kind of track all your brain states and how it changes. And so I, I would Google the Flow Dojo. That's a really cool thing. I, I would add to that ecstatic dance, holotropic breath work, and kundalini yoga. Those are three things that also I'm excited about. Yeah, so the way that I approach it is, oh yeah, yes, the question was how do we start to communicate these, these kinds of ideas about you know, flow states or the altered states economy or that psychedelics are medicine again to people whose default setting and cultural programming has certain ideas or associations related to this stuff where they might like contract and reject anything that we want to bring to them. You know, the, I think the hallmark of good interpersonal communication is to really try to meet somebody where they're at. And so it's like, it's not just what you want to tell them, but it's inferring, and this is an intuitive approach, but it's figuring out how you can land it for them. Because it doesn't matter how rich the information you have to share. If it's not going to land, then you're, you're wasting your time. And so it's, it's a bit about knowing your audience. It's the same thing when, when you do a public talk. It's, it's a sense of connection and knowing who you're talking to and how it's going to land. 
And an example of that would be, well, Rick Doblin con con convincing the FDA to legalize you know, MDMA or, or the, Richard, the Johns Hopkins University stuff with Roland Griffiths and psilocybin mushrooms inducing mystical type experiences and curing people. You notice they don't spend a lot of time saying, you know, these molecules, they show people God, you know, and then they're cured. FDA, legalize this. No, know your audience. The Food and Drug Administration, like, get rid of your tie-dye shirt and put on a suit and be like, ladies and gentlemen, you know, we have a crisis of suffering. PTSD sufferers are killing themselves. U.S. Army veterans are killing themselves in enormous numbers, okay? The, that, that, that conservative audience will hear you out, right? Patriotism, duty, government, yeah, people are suffering. The traditional medicines are not working, okay? Here we have a compound that dampens fear in the brain and allows a person to process their trauma in a way that they feel safe, and essentially that cognitive repatterning allows for a form of self-healing that we can quantifiably measure later. Six months later, a year later, the person no longer meets the criteria for PTSD. So there's epistemic value. Guess what? That's reason enough to try it without getting into language that those audiences are going to reject. That was the problem with Timothy Leary, right? That's why he got kicked out of Harvard. He started wearing too many tie-dye shirts and too much kumbaya. And nothing wrong with kumbaya, okay? This morning I was crying my eyes out with my girlfriend in the gospel, okay? Nothing wrong with that. But just know your audience, right? Know your audience, know the language, and then find a way of not frightening who you're talking to if what you're inviting them to is to open up. Because when people's worldview is contradicted, it's kind of like you're threatening them with death, right? I don't know if you're familiar with terror management theory, but the human fear of death is so strong that we cling to our mythic hero systems and our cultures as a character, as this like vital lie. And we cling to it for dear life. And when that's why people of different political viewpoints hate each other with such vitriol because another person's belief being so different than mine is like a threat to my life you know what i mean that's how people that's what people are coming from so you got to meet them where they're at and invite them to disarm before anything is going to get in so that's what i would say so i'll add to that yes meet people where they're at and and the other thing is um be the change so continue to work on yourself show up for them with your new self, with love and compassion, hold space for them. And at some point they'll come to you with a challenge and they'll say, how are you doing this? How are you finding your growth? And when they start asking questions, then you can start adding more on. I mean, Stealing Fire was a New York Times bestseller, so. Feel like you can 
Uh, re- re- I'll, I'll take a shot at sum- yeah. summarizing. So the 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 the, 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 the the question is is that flow state is becoming so popular that people are uh, generating things that they think are flow state within them and following that in paths that are leading them in directions that are not leading to happiness. Is that reasonable? Or that there's a the, the, the mythology of flow state will lead people in directions where like they're not actually in flow state and it takes them in off directions or something like that. Is that Ish? Yeah, or I mean, just things that aren't good for them that they think are good for them. Okay, so you might end up doing something that's not good for you because of that. So, my crack at an answer for that is um, don't confuse flow state with the peak experience. Right? Flow state is, I get, for me, again, in my experience, flow state is every moment. You are in flow right now. You are just keeping yourself from realizing you're in flow. And waking up and hating your job or a relationship or anything that you're in is partially your own willingness to be happy and sit and like find inner peace. And partially because the trauma that you've experienced or the preconceived notions you have are leading you to uh, find small ways to make yourself feel better for moment and moment moment, like moving to a city, like you said, or quitting one job and going for another, and finding those bits of sugar that give you a boost, right? And chasing flow state can be that bit of sugar, right? Everybody knows friends who have done like 20 ayahuasca ceremonies but don't seem to have fixed anything, right? Which is why the peak experiences are not the answer on themselves. It's why the daily discipline of starting to do your work is really the thing and things like meditation and studying consciousness and Byron Katie and like all these different tools that are out there, use them all and they weave together slowly as you get deep in the discipline, stick with it, it's uncomfortable and at some point like you're gonna start shaking loose of those old stories that you tell yourself of who you are and you'll start finding yourself. And we are out of time, amen. Thank you guys for coming. Appreciate your beautiful attention. Thank you. All right, yeah. Thank you so much. Jason Silva, Seth Miller.